All right. We uh, have been in the story of the prodigal son. Our heart's desire is when we have finished our little thing on the prodigal son, which is really the unprodigal father, that the thing that we, we remember is something, anything, just for God's sake, just remember something. <laughs> um, you know, we don't want to get to the end of it and then, you know, the next week I say, anybody remember anything on that, what we just finished up? And someone goes, well, I know the story. Well, you knew the story before we shared. <clears throat> but I think one of the things that, um, that I wish we could be impressed with, and I hope and pray that the Holy Spirit will uh, impress upon our hearts, is that this story is the story of a father. It is a story of what he wants from his sons. And what he wants from his sons is his son. <clears throat> Now, of course, we know that this isn't a gender thing at all. It is that God, whether male or female, God wants his son out of us. Um, but we, we, you know, when, what was it, two classes ago, I, I talked about, uh, Jesus, and Jesus said, a certain man had two sons. You remember that? And um, when Jesus said, a certain man, he had a certain man in mind. You know, he had someone in mind, and it was his father. It was his father who had been his father before he came to earth, who had been his father all the way back to creation, who had been his father. It was that one that he had, um, he had always, um, in his heart. And uh, it made me think of a couple of scriptures, and you don't have to turn there. Sometimes it's really important that we turn and look. And sometimes maybe if we just focus on really trying to hear. But I was thinking about the scripture in John 8, and uh, it's verse 29, and it says, and this is Jesus speaking, and he that sent me is with me. <laughs> okay. You know? I mean, he's that close. He's that much a part of, of his, you know, the father's never been to earth <laughs> in that sense, you know, the way that, you know. But he's with Jesus because he's in him. And, and um, <clears throat> but then he goes, the, this is still the same verse. The father hath not left me alone. You know, and, and, um, You know, we, I don't know, we can go through so much stuff because we feel alone, because we feel rejected or whatever. But with Jesus, God isn't God. It's not like God is with me. You know, I mean, that's, that, I think that's a big deal. It's his father that's with him. And remember what Jesus said when he rose from the dead and said goodbye. He said, I, I go unto my father and unto your father. You know? And um, Jesus had a relationship with the father that we now have, or it is ours whether we take advantage of that relationship or not. And when you feel alone or when you feel <clears throat> you know, um, I don't know, that's a funny example. This is probably what started. Just before we left, I, uh, I was upstairs in my office up there, and so I had to go to the bathroom. And I went into the bathroom, and I sat down on the toilet, sorry. And I have this light that is a motion detector light. And that's what I use in my bathroom to cut down on electricity so that we don't run up a too high of a bill. And um, so I'm, I'm sitting there, you know, and all of a sudden the light goes out. <laughs> and, uh, of course, all you got to do is this, you know what I mean, and it's back on. But 
but I didn't do that. I just sat there, and I was I was a little bit taken with how dark it was and how you could feel how a person could feel under some circumstance in a very dark place and very alone. And um, of course, <laughs> you know, I I kind of chuckled under my breath because I am not alone. My Lord is my life, and, my, and, and God is Jesus' his Father, therefore my Father. And um, so I think that's how <clears throat> a bunch of that came. The rest of that verse goes on to say, For I do always those things that please him. I do always those things that please him. Um, if you remember the, the elder son in Luke 15 with the prodigal son, the elder son, when he um, got upset that somebody that hadn't tried as hard as he had tried was being honored and blessed and loved on and all, the, all those things, um, his, his declaration wasn't, um, that I've always sought to please you. It was basically, I, I've, I've done everything right. You know, I've been correct. You know, being correct can, can get you in trouble with God. <laughs> I mean, doesn't that sound crazy? Because that's our emphasis. Our emphasis can't be, I gotta do right, I gotta be correct, I gotta, I gotta be a Christian. You know, I don't wanna be a Christian. I wanna be with my father, and that's the thing. See, the father, got this, this my son was dead to me in the sense of I didn't have the son, but now I have that relationship in him. And the example I've always thought of since, since God, when I was in Bible school, began to reveal the father-son relationship and that I'd been brought into that, this picture has never left me. That when the father hugs his son Jesus and just loves him and just hugs him and everything, I'm in there going, oh, you know, I'm in Jesus. I'm in him. And that's where I'm getting my whatever juice to go on or whatever or to, or to find acceptance. I find it in him, but in a real way. It really, really in him. And um, Jesus' approach, Jesus, the son, his approach is not um, trying to do it all right, trying to have everything work out, trying to put together that which is just going to really, you know, be a great job or a great ministry or a great whatever, you know, all the things that, that can assail, assail our souls, you know, that, that stuff's hard to assail our spirit when we're in tune with the Lord, um, isn't it? But, you know, when our soul is in ascendancy, oh man, we go through all kind of stuff. And it's like my spirit has to sit down here and shut up. Don't bring up Jesus because I'm not in the mood or whatever. Instead of I want, I, you know, my father is with me always, Jesus said. Jesus is with me always. His life, his, but see, not just, and here's the, here's the religious problem with that. We say Jesus is with me always because we ask him into our heart and therefore he's in there so he's with me always. That's not what Jesus meant when he said my father is with me, I'm not alone. He didn't just mean that he's, he's, he prayed a prayer or whatever and that the father was somewhere in there. He meant I am with him and he is with me. Then the very words he's speaking is I am with him. Amen. You know, bless you. And um, so uh, the verse in front of this says, then said Jesus unto them, when you have, well, let me, let me not go to that one first. Let's go to verse 26, and you're not even looking, so just listen. I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true. 
and I speak to the world those things which I've heard of him. See, there's a communion. There's a real reality, and we're supposed to have that kind of communion and real reality with Jesus in such a way that we don't have to figure out what to do or what to say or when to do or when to say or what, whatever we're trying to um, accomplish in this flesh. But we can, we can draw from one that, you know, here's what we'd say. I can draw one from one who is all-knowing, so I'll know what to do. But we can draw from one who is, who is everything to us and that is not going to be motivated by circumstances. He's going to try to motivate us by life. You know, I thought about that with a prayer request. Somebody says, you know, Randy or any of us, uh, so-and-so, they're in a bad place and this and that and whatever. And, you know, and so I pray, oh, Lord, take them out of the hard place. Take them out of the place where you could actually deal with them on things you couldn't have dealt with otherwise. Take them... Take them out of just fix that situation because that situation is really what life is all about. Just, just magically by your power use that to void out everything that would draw my heart closer to you and find you beyond, above, and outside of that circumstance. Because isn't God greater than that circumstance? Isn't he higher? Isn't he further? Okay, so I know, I know some can judge me and say, well, you know, you're not much of a shepherd with that kind of attitude. I'll just leave it at that. I'll leave that in your mind. I'll just leave it at that and let the Father judge if he understands what a true shepherd is and his place is. Okay, so... Then verse 27, Jesus says this, they understood not what he spake to them of the Father. Okay, all right. So if, if a person has not moved into the father-son relationship by Christ, then they're not going to understand anything that Jesus or me or anybody else, any of you, that what you teach. They're going to go, okay, and they'll relegate it to some weird place that has no power and no life and no reality other than, well, I know. I know. I know theologically. But, you know, what, what are we missing by doing that? The Father, then they understood not that he spoke to them of the Father. And then, I like this last verse I'm going to read here, and it's verse 28. It says, Then said Jesus unto them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, which he's talking about the cross, then shall you know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. He's saying, when I've been hung on a cross, you'll know that I didn't choose that, but I'm there because my father chose that, and I am with him in this, and I do all the, always those things that please the father. Okay, well, that sure knocks out, well, I'm always pleasing. You know, I'm always, you know, I'm a man pleaser or a woman pleaser for you husbands. Or whatever. I do always those things that please the Father. And when the Son of Man is lifted up, then shall you know that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things, and this is what I'm telling you. That, that his, the things that he's saying to me are going to lead me to Calvary. And I, I do those things. I do them because they please him. Okay, so in Luke 15 then, verse, I forget, 11, Jesus starts the parable of the, 
prodigal son saying, and Jesus said, a certain man had two sons, two sons. And from there, the story rolls. It rolls with the tenor of the song of what the heart of the Father wants, even in the hard stuff, even in the, even in the uh, hog pen, even in the, it rolls with the Father's heart. Jesus is telling us a story of one that he knew well before he came down and was incarnated in the earth. And, it, and, and we may not hear the song. We may not feel the rolling of this story in the heartbeat of the Father. But Jesus does. And he knows what he's talking about. And he's not just making up a little story that, uh, let's see, let me think of something, some way to just make up some people and stuff and maybe I can teach you something. You're not going to teach Adam anything. Adam is already set. You will teach him religious things that he can spout, but you'll never reteach him, uh, re-educate him, renew him. There's only one. There's only one place, and Jesus is saying, "I do always those things that please the Father." I'm going to the cross, and I'm taking Adam with me. I mean, it just gets that simple. The cross is what we need. We need a Jesus that's going to the cross. Do, is that wrong? I mean, am I bad for saying such a thing? That we need a Jesus that's going to take us to the cross. And that's what he was saying in, in uh, John 8. Yes. That's why it's a certain God. Yes. Yeah, and we talked about that, him being a certain, a certain man. And I know that Jesus is certain about this father, this man. He is certain about him. And, you know, the thing about the, our relationship with the father is um, that if we will pass through the valley of the shadow of death, if we will pass through the cross, if we will embrace the necessity for why else would we be crucified with Christ? Except that it's absolutely a necessity to get to the Father. Mm -hmm. I am the way and the truth and the life. And he's, folks, that's in chapter 14. I, if I remember correctly, that's within two weeks of the cross. And he knows that he's going to have to take us there He's going to have to crucify the old nature, and he's going to have to, those that accept that, because he cannot. Now, we do this all the time, but he cannot drag Adam into the father's house, into the father's heart. He can't do that. It's impossible to do that. But we, we allow the semblance of that all the time within the framework of the theology of the father's heart, instead of the reality of the Father's heart. The reality, the reality. And that reality, it, you know, it's not, well, how do I do this? Well, how do I do that? Well, should I do this or should I do that? The great reality of it is, I'm with you, Jesus. Whatever you say, what I hear of you, that's what I speak. I, you know what I mean? It's coming from a reality of oneness. It's coming from a reality of a hymnness, which is the true meaning of oneness. H I M, hymnness. Because you're drawing, and, and, and you see, we don't, even have, we don't even go to the cross. He takes us. We don't even come forth from the cross. He brings us forth in Him. We don't even go to the Father. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life of that relationship. But it's not passive. It is active faith in not doing it yourself. <laughs> you know, because, we're, because we want to 
we we hear something we go oh i want to i want to please the father and and yet what we're really maybe saying is that i don't want to do anything wrong so you know so we miss start missing the point again because our heart is wrong and and we don't know his heart and here's what i mean when i say our heart is wrong i'm not talking about evil i'm not talking about being a bad person i'm not talking about all of the things that we would think when I say our heart is wrong, I'm talking about it's not focused toward the heart of the Father and the heart of the Lord. It's not focused there. It's not moving. In him we live and move and have our being. And there, there is life forevermore. There is joy forevermore. There is going to be the fulfillment of the plan of God. But outside of it, I don't care how good it looks, it's just religion. It's just religion. It is. It's just religion. Say, well, I'm sincere. Well, you're sincerely wrong. You know, you, you, you want, but there's a still a wanting for you. You have to want for the Father's sake, like Jesus did, didn't he? I mean, that was what he was saying. I want this for the Father's sake. And allow that heart, just, just pray. When you pray, don't pray all this stuff. Pray, I mean, that, God will take care of that if he can get some, you know, in the image of Christ. Just pray and say, Oh, Holy Spirit, oh, Jesus, I want the Father's heart, and I want to, and I know that comes by you in us, but I want this flow of, of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and I just want to be wrapped up in that by life. And keep your heart, even if it's just kind of chugging along, <laughs> keep it as best as you can, focus in the right direction. Amen. we got to stop. We'll come back in a few minutes for the next one.